Would you stand together with me, please, as we look at God's Word together? And our scripture reading tonight comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 41. I will be reading verses 1 through 13 of Psalm, chapter 41. Blessed is he who has regard for the weak, that the Lord delivers him in times of trouble. The Lord will protect him and preserve his life. He will bless him in the land and not surrender him to the desire of his foes. The Lord will sustain him on his sickbed and restore him from his bed of illness. I said, Lord, have mercy on me. Heal me, for I sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and have his name and his name perish? Whenever one comes to see me, he speaks falsely while his heart gathers slander. Then he goes out and spreads it abroad. All my enemies whisper together against me. They imagine the worst for me, saying, A vile disease has beset him. He will never get up from the place where he lies. Even my close friend, whom I trusted, he who shared my bread has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, have mercy on me. Raise me up that I may repay them. I know that you are pleased with me, for my enemy does not triumph over me. In my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come to this time of our uh, time together, as we look into your word, I just pray for your, uh, your guidance and your uh, direction in our lives. I pray, Father, that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth would be pleasing and satisfying to you as we look to your word together. In your name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I could be wrong, but I think one of the most painful things that any of us have ever had to endure is the pain of being betrayed. Maybe, just maybe, the, the death of a spouse or a child is, is equally hard, but I think in some ways betrayal is even more uh, painful because the betrayer doesn't die. They stay there. And even if they would, the pain of betrayal stays with us for a long, long time. And you know that. I'm not telling you anything new. If you've ever been betrayed by somebody, you know what I mean by that. You know, people that, that say one thing and, and then do another. I, I, I had that happen in a, a job that I had one time when uh, I, after having left working at this place, was talking with somebody that was still working there, a former employee, uh, former uh, co-worker of mine. And I said something about a certain person and they got a funny look on their face. I said, what? They said, he's been bad about you since the day you walked out the door. He said, I hate to tell you this, but he said, in his eyes, you were a total idiot. And when I was working there, I thought he was one of my closest friends. But I found out later that it really wasn't true friendship. He really was stabbing me in the back and throwing me under the bus. That hurts. Betrayal destroys families. Betrayal can take a ministry and just tear it apart in, in a matter of days. Betrayal can take a business that's thriving and turn it to bankruptcy. It, it, it's, it's tough. It, sometimes, you know, sometimes betrayal is, is uh, it's unintentional. You know, there can be those times when uh, you don't really mean to betray the person, but they've told you something and you're talking with somebody else and all of a sudden it's kind of like, you know, splits up. It's kind of like, and as soon as it splits out, you want to pull that word bubble back, but you know you can't, it's already out there. And you've unintentionally thrown somebody out under the bus. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes, and I think we're probably more like this in the church, sometimes betrayal, is, it, it's meant to be uh, okay, it's meant to be good, the motives are right, but it just didn't work out that way. And what I'm thinking of mostly, in the, being a pastor's kid, I grew up on this, is and we don't, un, unfortunately, but fortunately, we don't do this anymore, but that's the Wednesday night prayer meeting. It's a great place for gossip. Well, we need to pray for, you know, Harry and Joanne, because, you know, they're, sorry, I didn't pick anybody here that was actually here. <laughs> Harry and uh, Rita, because, you know, they're having marital problems again. And I hear, I hear Harry is drinking again. And you know, and, and it was 
started off being a prayer request and ended up being a you know backstabbing moment. And then pretty soon everybody in the church knows that you know Harry and Rita are having marital problems. We've we've ended up betraying some some trust. David knew about betrayal. You know, there's also the intentional kind of betrayal that apparently David had. We don't understand in this particular psalm what was going on in David's life. But we, we do know from the psalm and from the, what he has said in it that apparently something happened that was very traumatic to him where somebody had basically stabbed him in the back, where somebody had thrown him under the bus and he was struggling with it. And, and we can gain, I think, some real benefit by seeing how he handled that. Uh, so let's take a look as we just kind of walk through this psalm together and highlight a few points. Uh, the first three verses, uh, David is sort of uh, starting out his prayer. This whole psalm, a song, is a prayer. And it starts out by saying, Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. He protects and preserves them. They are counted among the blessed in the land. He does not give them over to the desires of their foes. The Lord sustains them. And they're on their sick bed and restores them from their time, their bed of illness. What David is probably doing here, as most scholars agree, is that he's he's sort of setting the stage for his, the rest of his prayer. It's really almost like he's uh, saying, it not in a, a prideful way, but in a, a rather humble way of saying, you know, Lord, when people do the right kind of thing, you bless them. When people are good, are helping the weak, and when they're they're reaching out to the poor. You you bless them. You help them. You lift them up from their bed of illness. You 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 show yourself to them in a real way. And and he's almost implying there that that was what David was doing. That he was doing all those things, which leads next to the next verse because then what he almost does is he almost switches the the gears as a sense in his prayer. He says, I and I said, have mercy on me, Lord. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. And, and so he kind of changes the, the tone of his prayer where he's saying, it, 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 I know that I've sinned. I know I'm not perfect. And have mercy on me because, and then he goes on to the next couple of verses, he says, because my enemies, and then the next several verses come. And what he's doing, it's almost like if you take those first few verses of this psalm, he's saying, Lord, you know that I've done the right kinds of things. I've helped the weak. I've reached out to those that are struggling. I've done the right stuff for you. I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I've had sins. But listen to me, because you ought to see what my enemies are doing to me. You ought to see what's going on. And one of the things I appreciate about David when he writes in the Psalms is he says stuff like this. He says, Lord, take a look at my enemies like the Lord doesn't already see this going on. But it's almost like he kind of reminds them. And here's what he says. He says, first of all, he says, Have mercy on me, heal me, or uh, he says, My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? 21st century translation of what that would be is, is his enemies are really saying, David, why don't you just die? Why don't you just die? End it all. Put us out of your misery. Put yourself out of your, uh, our misery. And just die. You might think that sounds harsh, but let me tell you, there's kids in our schools that hear that every single day from the bullies in the hallway. Of this, you know, you're not worthy. We we know stories on, on the news of people that of kids that have committed suicide and they checked their Facebook page later on and found out that kids were sending a message just saying, just die. You're not of any value. How must that make you feel? Fortunately, I don't know because to the best of my knowledge, it could be, but to the best of my knowledge, nobody has said that to me. You know, just die, just, just be out of here. Maybe they have. But I can imagine the pain that that must have caused to David. Then he goes on to say, and when one of them comes to see me, he speaks falsely while his heart gathers slander. Then he goes out and spreads it around. The implication of this verse is that David from time to time would have visitors come and they sit down with him and say, So Dave, how are things going? How can I help you? What, what struggle are you, are you having? Uh, what, what can I do to, uh, to help you out? And then after they do that, then they go out. And they spread around all the gospel of what they said. And then he said this. 
And then he said that. And then you know what he had the audacity to say. And they went out and they started spreading all of these stories about David. Some of them were probably true. Some of them were half-truths. Some of them were complete lies. Because a lot of times when people betray you, the main motivation for the intentional betrayals, at least, is pride. And so what they need to do in order to build themselves up is to put you down. And the way they do that is either through half-truths or outright lies or telling people things in a factual way when they really aren't facts. And you can destroy people that way. That's one of the reasons that, that uh, James writes, and he says that the tongue is, is the most dangerous weapon we have. It's, you know, you can train a horse with a small bridle, but you can't train the tongue. And that's what these guys, whoever they were, were doing with David. And then it goes on to say in verse uh, 7, All my enemies whisper together against me, they imagine the worst for me. They whisper together against me. Can you imagine what that's like? If you had a whole group of people talking around behind your back. One of the best, and I'm not saying this happens as I I don't think it does, thankfully. One of the best ways to destroy a ministry and to bring a pastor down is for him to be the last one to know that there's a problem. Because everybody else is talking about it and nobody's coming to him. And the same thing is true in our marriages, the same thing is true in our workplaces, the same thing is true in the community, is that you can destroy a lot of people by not going to them with the issue, but doing, you know, going around to everybody else. And that's what these people were doing that were talking about David, is they were going around telling everybody else everything. Uh, this is, I like the next verse here. A vile disease has afflicted him, he will never get up from the place he lies. Oh, what an encouraging thing to say. He's sick. He's going to die. He's hopeless. He's never going to get out of this. There's no hope. And then in verse 9, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who I shared bread with, has turned against me. We don't get the, the, the meaning of that in our culture, but you shared bread with somebody that, that was a very intimate kind of a, a reference to something. And David said, this was my friend. You know, I've got a friend that, uh, <coughs> he's been my friend since, well, probably for the last 50 years. And um, he, especially in the last 10 or about the last 20 years or so, we've become very, very close friends. We don't always see each other, but when we do, it's one of those kinds of things where it's almost like you've never been apart. We're very close. And we would both tell you, he would tell you the same thing, is that in the course of our friendship, which is extremely close, there's been times when we would have killed each other at the drop of a hat. And we would have deserved it. There's times that you know, he, he deserved to kill me because of the stuff I've done to him, and vice versa. But we have that kind of a close friendship that we, that's indescribable. David had that with Saul's son, Jonathan, where he said, Jonathan is the one that I, I love him. Whoever it was that stabbed David in the back, was his very, very best friend. It's interesting because this phrase, this, uh, this verse was also uh, quoted by Jesus later on at the Last Supper. When he's talking to the disciples and he says, one of you will betray me. And they're all asking the question, of, who would do such a thing, Jesus? Even Judas said, who would do such a thing, Jesus, even though he'd already done it? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what you just got to kind of wonder where Judas' head was at. He walked with Jesus for three years, 24 7 that he was with him. When Jesus chose his 12 disciples, he prayed all night about who to choose. Judas wasn't chosen by accident. Can you imagine what it was like for the three years that they were together? Every time Jesus would heal somebody, do you think he kind of looked over at Judas to see what he was looking at? When Judas came back with all the other disciples, all excited because they had been healing the sick and raising the, the dead, and, and they had this marvelous ministry, and they came back all excited and telling Jesus about it to the point where, if you read about it in Mark, Jesus almost said, okay, calm down, guys, take a breath, Let's just get away from here. Let's go talk this stuff out. Just relax for a minute. Judas was in that group. 
There's an interesting passage in Revelation where God is, is describing the, the gates of heaven. There's 12 gates in heaven, one for each apostle. Judas has got his own pillar in heaven, even though he didn't make it, because he was one of Jesus' apostles. And, and yet Jesus says, I'm not referring to all of you, I know those who I have chosen, but this is to fill the passage of scripture, he who shared my bread has turned against me. What a stunning statement that Jesus made about somebody that he knew in every circle they were in was watching for an opportunity. And we, I, you know, I don't know exactly what was going through this head, but you know, being betrayed, it can haunt us for the rest of our lives. Some people never get over the hurt of being betrayed. Some people can never get past that pain and the agony that they experienced when that was done. It, it, it removes their, their self-confidence. It removes their ability to trust other people. It removes their ability to really even uh, function sometimes. Some of the, and sometimes people, as a result of being betrayed, commit suicide. Because there's just no more hope left. Look at what David says uh, in another passage in, in uh, Psalm 55. It says, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it's you. A man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship in the house of God as we walked among worshipers. But David is saying, yeah, I know there's people that don't like me, and I can get by with that. I, I can understand people that want to get happy, but you? You are the one I counted on. You're the one I rely on you do this to me. We each have those kind of situations to varying degrees. But what I want to share with us um, this that evening is to help us to get through it. If you're struggling with that, and you know somebody else that's struggling with that whole idea of betrayal, how can we get past that? And I think the first thing we need to do is we need to remember who we are. You know, one of the things I appreciate about the Bible is I've been reading the Bible since I could read. And I read, there's passages that I've read over and over again and all of a sudden I'll see a verse that I've never seen before, and it just jumps off the page at you, and you just go, wow, do you see what this says? And this verse here is one of those. David says this, you now realize his mindset. He's been stabbed in the back, he's been thrown under the bus. He's got people around him that wish he was dead. Some of those people are the closest friends that he had. And this is what he says, I know that you are pleased with me. Just that little phrase. Think of what that means. David is saying, I'm lower than a wagon wheel rut right now. I feel completely abandoned. I feel completely worthless. I've been thrown under the bus. I've been stabbed. I feel all alone. But, and it's a big one, but I know you are pleased with me. Now think about the struggle you've got, that whatever struggle you're going through tonight. Think about whatever it is that you're, that, that's weighing you down, that's keeping you awake at night, that, that's a struggle of whatever proportions. How would that be different if we could really, really grasp what this verse is saying? In spite of the fact that other people don't like you, in spite of the fact that other people find fault with you, you can know that the God of the universe, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one that created everything around us, is pleased with you. Does anything else matter? Think about you know, one, of the, one of the reasons that the sticker industry has grown to such magnificent proportions is because we all like stickers. When you were in kindergarten, and maybe older, you would do anything for a sticker on the paper, wouldn't you? Because what did that mean? That meant your teacher thought you were special enough to get a sticker. And what David is saying here is Jesus wants to give each of us a sticker. Because he's pleased with us. He goes on to say, and he says, I know you're pleased with me. 
And here's the reason I know it, because my enemy does not triumph over me. And the reason for that is because if I know God is for me, I don't care what anybody else thinks about me. If I know what God wants, then that's all that matters. If you don't like me, you're a loss. Because the person that does like me is stronger than you. So that's what he says. It's first of all, remember your identity. The second thing is to realize the pain. David says in, in verse 4, backing up a little bit, says, Have mercy on me, Lord. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. I think sometimes we need to... We have this mentality in, in the Western world, especially with in the, you know, the whole suck it up mentality. You know, especially as guys, we're famous for it. We don't want to admit any issues in our lives because we're men. So we never get hurt. We're not going to have any problems. Sometimes we need to come to the point that David did of just saying, have mercy on me, I'm struggling right now. And being able to come to God just honestly and saying, I'm hurting. You know, what so-and-so did to me, I know I shouldn't let it bother me, but I'm hurt. So we need to realize the pain, come before God and be honest with Him. And then lastly is to restore yourself. Uh, David says in Psalm 41, 12, because of my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. The word integrity has the idea of being honest. Being honest with yourself, being honest with other people, being true to who you are. It means, first of all, removing yourself from the fire, so to speak. You see, I don't think that God wants us to be in abusive situations. I don't think God wants us to be in a situation where I, I had a friend once, and he is a very dear friend, but we were going through some struggles. And uh, he had heard some things about me, and he bought into a hook, line, and sinker. And they were a lot of lies. And he cornered me one time, and we, he said, Mike, step into this closet a minute. I want to talk to you. It was literally a broom closet. All right? And we were at a function, and I was dumb enough to step in there. And we stepped in, and he started to ripped me up one side and down the other, telling me how evil I was, that I was full of poison, how can I consider myself a Christian? He was going on and on and on, and somebody interrupted us. And so he had to stop, because somebody came in to get some supply out of the closet. This is going to show you how stupid I really am. So we step out of the hallway, and there's another closet right next door that said, Jesus, step in here, and I did! He already attacked me three times. Here, go. Let me give you the other side. What you know, David says, sometimes we need to remove ourselves from that. Sometimes we just need to move ourselves away from those things that are going to be abusive and hurtful. The second thing is we need to release the offender. What I mean by that is we need to forgive. We need to forgive. And forgiveness doesn't mean they deserve forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't about the other person. Forgiveness is about you. And just release them and say, you know what? You hurt me. I didn't deserve what you did to me. And I'm going to have bruises for a long, long time. And you know what? I'm going to forgive you, not because you deserve it, but because I have a life. And I'm going to live that life in the joy and the peace that I can have through God. And the third thing is to refuse to retaliate. <laughs> That's a tough one. Because we all want, and we always want to try to get that that edge. We always want to try to get that um, the top rung, the top of the other person. Paul says in one of his uh, letters in Corinthians, he says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Yeah. If somebody has hurt us, if somebody is attacking us, we need to turn that over to God. And that's not easy to do, but that's uh, the important thing. I think probably this video says it best, so what I'm trying to say.
One of the things that I think is um, always good to remember, especially when you look at the Easter story, Jesus understands. Just leave it at that. Whatever struggle you're going through, Jesus understands. Whatever pain has happened to you, Jesus understands. The number of times you failed yourself or other people, or he's, others have failed you, Jesus understands. John 8, 32, Jesus says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That verse is so full-packed, I mean, we could do a whole sermon series just on that, but to think of what that really means. You will know the truth about yourself. You're loved and forgiven by Jesus, and that truth will set you free. You will know the truth about other people, that they're failures, that they will fail you, that they won't always be there for you, and that truth will set you free because you know Jesus loves you. And you should know the truth about God, that he'll never fail you, and that will set you free. Such an uh, amazing verse that reminds us of all that Jesus is for us. Would you stand with me, please, if you close? And as we uh, prepare to sing our closing number, um, I'm going to stop playing with this because I keep forgetting my own back there, sorry. As we close with this final number, just to spend a few seconds in prayer, what I want to ask tonight as we, you know, focus our attention on betrayal and on, on being hurt, uh, I want you to just take a few minutes, a few seconds really, to just bow before God. If there's some pain, some struggle that you're really struggling with tonight, where somebody has hurt you deeply, what I want to ask of you tonight is to give it up. Not in the sense of just suck it up, but as in giving it to Jesus and asking Him, being open with Him, maybe for the first time, of saying, you know my pain, please take it from me. Let's pray. Lord, there is no pain greater than the betrayal of a friend. Those that we have counted on that, that turn on us. I pray that uh, the lesson we learned from David, the lesson that we learned from you, would remind us and encourage us as we go from this place to live in the freedom that we can have. Thank you for the promise of that verse 11 that says, If you're pleased with me. I'm just so thankful for that. I thank you in your name. Amen. Let's go by singing. Now to him who is able to his plan through his power in each of our lives, to him who is able to do far above and beyond all that we could ask or imagine, to him be all the praise and all the honor and the glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.